Now, given my recent video about how Justinian Paris is a Loyalist Space Marine I want to see come up in future books, let's talk about Loyalist Space Marines that we want to come back to the modern setting of Warhammer 40,000. I thought you were dead. My death was greatly exaggerated. So, you're the punk I've heard about. Hi, I'm Krona the Harlequin, and welcome back to Live from the Black Library, where today we are going to discuss 10 Loyalist Space Marines that we want back. Now, I should note, there are some Heresy-era Marines on this list, but everything on the list is in the context of them appearing in a modern 40k book. So they would be Heresy-era Marines, whose storyline either never got resolved and could still be alive some way or another, or who we know are still alive in the current setting. And nobody who is confirmed to be dead, because that would just be retreading ground. So no Saul Tarvitz and no Shadrach Medusin. Sorry guys. But before we get into it, I just want to say thank you so much for watching this video. Please subscribe if you have not already done so, and without further ado, let's get into 10 Loyalist Space Marines that we want back in the setting. Now, funny thing is, this list was actually way harder to make than the previous video where I listed 10 traitor marines we want back in the setting. It's part of a wider problem that I touched on in my previous video about Justinian Paris, a Primaris Ultramarine I really like and that I mentioned in the opener to this video. A lot of loyalist space marines can simply just come across as uninteresting, and due to their very generic, loyal, interchangeable storylines and motivations, it can be really hard to get attached to specific marines because they can all feel the same, as opposed to traitors who tend to be more unique. There's only one Azek Araman, there's only one Erebus, there's only one Eidolon. However, the marines in this video, hopefully, could prove as examples as to why yes, loyalist marines can be interesting, and why GW should make more of an effort to bring them back. So, number one is Nikona Sherokin the Raven Guard from the Horus Heresy. Now, the reason a Horus Heresy era Marine is in the list, as previously stated, is because there's a good chance he's still alive. Reason being, the last we saw of him was in the Siege of Terra novella called Sons of the Selenar, where he went into stasis. And I'll get into why in a minute. You see, Nikona Sherokin was a Raven Guard and a survivor of Istvan V, where he would escape aboard a ship called the Sisyphium with several Iron Hands and Salamanders, and they would have their own special operations as they went through the galaxy, and they made their most notable appearance in the book Angel Exterminatus, where they hounded the Iron Warriors and Emperor's children on their plan to go into the Eye of Terror. And he, being a Raven Guard, was their stealth and infiltration operative, and he was also an incredible swordsman, to the point where he beat Lucius himself in a duel twice, killing him the second time, however he would be resurrected by Fabius Bile. So, we know he's pretty impressive. And furthermore, he actually came face to face with Alpharius. You see, Alpharius would disguise himself as Shadrach Medusin in order to enlist the help of the crew of the Sisyphium in eliminating some Alpha Legionnaires, who were actually loyalist Alpha Legionnaires that Alpharius wanted purged. So he set them up to get them to do it. And in the end, Alpharius would reveal his ruse and explain why he did what he did to Nikona Sherokin. The killing of the Alpha Legionnaires thing, not the whole thing with the Cabal, that would be a little too much. And ultimately opted to let him live. Now, his story ends off with him and the rest of the Sisyphium arriving in system around Terra, and making their way to Luna, because they would be hailed by survivors of the Selenar Gene Cult in order to evacuate something called the Magma Mater. What this was, was genetic material, perfect genetic material, of all 20 Primarchs. Yes, including the two lost ones. And they wanted to make sure it wouldn't fall into traitor hands, so they enlisted the help of the Sisyphium crew. And all of them would die in the evacuation attempt, except Nikona Sherokin and one other. The other one would take their ship and fly off into the void to draw off the traitors, with the knowledge that they are going to catch up with him and kill him. However, Sherokin, for his part, goes into hibernation with the Magma Mater with a Cyber Eagle named Garuda and he would see the name on the Magma Mater as he went into stasis. That name being Sangprimus Portum. And why is that important? Because the Sangprimus Portum is what Rebute Gilliman would give to Belisarius Call after the heresy in order to start the Primaris Space Marine project. So that means, yes, Nikona Sherokin was awoken along with the Cyber Eagle. But what happened after that? Now, it's possible he was just let go and able to rejoin the rest of the Raven Guard and help them rebuild and blah blah blah, but that's boring. 
I think what's more likely is he would have stuck by it as the protector of the Sang Primus Portum, as he gave his oath to do so, and likely would have gone back into hibernation. And since Belisarius Call has the Sang Primus Portum on his ship heavily guarded, who knows, maybe he has an Icona Sherokin on ice in there as a last line of defense. I just think it would be interesting to see anything other than he just vanishes from the narrative. And yes, I know this is a reach, but that's going to be a bit of a theme in this video for Heresy-era Marines. Yeah, they could have just vanished from the narrative and gone about their lives after the Heresy, but that's boring, and I think there is a possibility that they could still be kicking around in some form or another, and I'm just kind of hoping they are. Remember, this list was a lot harder to make. Next on the list is actually a big one, and I want to knock it out of the way as soon as possible all at once. And of course I'm talking about the Chapter Masters. Specifically, the Chapter Masters of the first founding chapters. However, this is aside from a few, specifically Marnius Calgar, who we get to see in the Plague War series, Dante, who we got to see in the Devastation of Baal book and a little bit at the end of Lion's Son of the Forest, so we know he's still around, and Asriel, because even though he hasn't really featured in any main books that I know of, he apparently comes up a fair bit in the new Dark Angels book, Lazarus Enmity's Edge. Now again, I haven't read that book, but I have heard he's in it, so I'm just gonna keep him off the list for now. So who am I referring to? Well, in this instance, I'm referring to Gregor Dessian, Chapter Master of the Imperial Fists, Tushan, Chapter Master of the Salamanders, the Salamanders have gotten very little love for a long time as of late, Kayvon Shrike, Chapter Master of the Raven Guard, who we do see a bit in some of the Damocles books before he became Chapter Master, so he does have something going for him there, but it has been more than five years since we've gotten him in a mainline book, so he is on the list. Cardin Strontos, who is the de facto Chapter Master of the Iron Hands. In reality, the Iron Hands don't actually have a Chapter Master. They have a Council of Iron Fathers, but he is the most prevalent one, so people cite him as the closest thing they have to a Chapter Master. Logan Grimnar, head of the Space Wolves, who we again have not seen for a long time, and who was the head of the Space Wolves during the Months of Shame incident, and killed the leader of the Grey Knights, but who we have seen very little of. And Jubal Khan, Chapter Master of the White Scars. So, the thing with Jubal Khan is, in my mind he's the most interesting, because he has to suffer with very severe injuries, that have basically left him almost dreadnought worthy, but not actually in a dreadnought. Instead, he's effectively interred within their fortress monastery on Chagoris, effecting events and guiding people with his wisdom and insight, and also having eyes and ears everywhere on the ground. That's very unique, especially for a white scar, and as such, he's the one I want back the most. And a side note, when you hear the name Jubal Khan, you probably think of the White Scar who was active during the Horus Heresy and died in the opening stages of the Siege of Terra. It's understandable that there might be a bit of confusion there, but it's not the same guy, just the same name. Now, the reason I put all these guys on the list is because, again, it's easier to just lump them into one because I didn't want to take up too much of this list with the obvious low-hanging fruit. But I do think they're worth putting on as an entry because We've gotten very little of these characters who you would expect to be very important, especially when compared to Dante and Marnius Calgar. Also, I'm not going to be putting any chapter masters for successor chapters on this list, so no Gabriel Seth, no Gabriel Angelos, no Tiberos the Red Wake, and no Asterion Moloch. I will say this though in regard to successor chapters while I'm on the topic, and it's that a lot of those really cool Primaris successors that people like, such as the Dark Krakens, Hi Mutt when you see this video, the Sons of the Phoenix, the Wolf Spears, and others who people theorize to be of Trader Gene stock, do not really have interesting characters yet. They exist conceptually on paper, possibly appearing in a Codex or a White Dwarf article, but they haven't been in any real books and as such, do not have characters. However, speaking of characters, one that people want back, and one that I think is the best example of a Loyalist Space Marine that people would love to see return is Merrick Grimaldus, the Hero of Hell's Reach, as if there was only one. Now, you probably know who Grimaldus is. I would say he's one of the most famous non-heresy era Space Marines, but outside of the book Hell's Reach, we have gotten scant little of him, and in my mind, that is a shame. Now, as a bit of a recap, Merrick Grimaldus was a chaplain of the Black Templar Space Marines chapter, and was active on the planet Armageddon during the Third War for Armageddon against the Orcs, specifically Orcs led by Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka. And therein, 
he would perform great deeds, fighting hard and rallying the people of the Hive of Hell's Reach to fight against the orcs no matter what, giving his famous speech, Our City, Our World. However, this was all under the thought that he was going to die on the planet of Armageddon. He was absolutely convinced of this. However, in the end, he would be the only member of his band of brothers to survive, ironically. And we leave off his escapades on Hell's Reach with him taking his leave from the Hive, a celebrated hero, but feeling the weight of the brothers he lost and the losses incurred by the mortal humans he fought beside. However, this was in no way the end of him on the planet because he would go on to find out about the plight of a chapter of Space Marines called the Celestial Lions, who had been incurring very heavy losses under suspicious circumstances. And when he met up with the survivors, he found around a hundred of them still alive out of the thousand of them that had been present on the planet at the outset of the war. And as it turned out, they had opposed an Inquisitor named Apollyon after he exterminatist a planet of 8 billion people that he had asked them for help liberating from a chaos uprising. So the chapter would then go on to denounce him. However, he would take this personally and was having them set up repeatedly on the planet, hoping to grind the chapter down to nothing. And to this end, he was almost successful, because they had accepted their fate and asked Grimaldus to give them last rites before they went off to die in a blaze of glory, seeing the chapter off as they saw fit. However, Grimaldus said, no, you must rebuild, stood beside them, and called the Astra Militarum forces of Hell's Reach to their aid, thereby single-handedly saving the chapter and earning the gratitude of chapter master Akene Dubaku. After this, he would depart the planet to join in the hunt for Gazgul that was being led by Commissar Yerik and High Marshal Helbrecht. And that's the last we see of him. Now, we do have a little bit of lore that I find interesting that happens post Great Rift, and it is that he has one, crossed to the Primaris Rubicon, and two, become the subject of a cult of worship on Armageddon. You see, the planet of Armageddon has had to deal with numerous demonic incursions since the opening of the Rift, as you would expect, and in their desperation, they have actually taken to worshipping Grimaldus as their patron saint, actually gathering pyres full of witches and heretics and traitors to burn alive in the ruins of the cathedral where he and his brothers made their last stand during the Third War for Armageddon, and where he was buried alive as well as doing other various ritualistic things. Now, the Imperium apparently has actually been monitoring this and finds no reason to believe this is too much of a deviation from the Imperial cult, but they apparently wonder what he himself would think of this. Now, I seem to have gone on a bit of a tangent here, but I can explain. The reason I really wanted to go in depth into what makes Grimaldus so important and everything about him is because it helps to weigh him against those characters I mentioned earlier. Saul Tarvitz, Garviel Loken, Nathaniel Garrow, Barabbas Dantioch, and so many others, the Heresy Era Ones. He is someone who has to deal with a lot of struggles, both internal and external, and is effectively kind of on his own in the galaxy, and has his own unique perspectives. Granted, I don't really know if he's on the same caliber as those Heresy Era Marines. Listen, I think I'm just a big heresy simp, but he still has a lot to him that I think could be very interesting in the modern setting. Especially since we have not seen how he interacts with the wider galaxy, we don't know how he feels about Gilliman or the Lion, and we don't know what he's been up to, especially since Yerik might be dead, and Gazgul has sort of fallen off the map. The problem with the two books he's shown up in, the novel Hell's Reach and the novella Blood and Fire, is that they're self-contained. They lack the wider context that makes a story of a character so interesting, as with the heresy. But I feel like tying him into wider novels could really help expand him, put him in more situations, and help develop him. And I think that's something a lot of people would want to see. What you need is a cohesive start-to-finish storyline, one that can go on for a little while, a set of unique characters, and a lot of internal struggling. And I think a good idea for this could be a series about the Imperium trying to finally track down and finish off Gazgul once and for all, because he's been a menace on the Imperium for far too long. New heroes could rise alongside old ones, and we would get a story that actually makes use of the orcs as a plot device, and we would see characters like Grimaldus come back to the fore. And the reason I'm so fond of this idea is because it would also bring back another Loyalist Space Marine who is on this list. And of course I'm talking about... Ragnar Blackmane. Now, I want to say this off the bat, the reason I chose Ragnar Blackmane instead of like Lucas the Trickster 
is because the last we got of Lucas the Trickster was in 2018, but the last we got of Blackmane was in 2015. However, I am very fond of characters that go back a long way, and Blackmane's first mention was in 2009. Now, Ragnar Blackmane, for his part, is actually the youngest wolf lord or captain in Space Wolves history. And as you can imagine, he's done some pretty amazing things. One of which being, he's the only Space Wolf to ever surpass the rank of Grey Hunter, going from Bloodclaw to Wolfguard. Basically what that means is he bypassed the rank of full Space Marine and went directly from being a neophyte to being a veteran. One of the reasons for this was because he fought a Thousand Sun Sorcerer by the name of Maddox, and Maddox would become his consistent nemesis all throughout those early books and short stories that feature him. And those were really old, back in the very early 2000s and even in 1999, making him, again, one of the oldest characters in the canon. There was also a brief period of time where he was banished to Terra because he lost the Spear of Rus, stopping a chaos invasion of Fenris that would have seen Magnus the Red summoned to the planet to destroy the chapter entirely. And yes, Maddox was involved in this too. But while there, he would get a really cool chainsword because he saved a Navis Nobilite from an assassination attempt. And he would eventually get the Spear of Rus back after swearing an oath to Logan Grimnar himself to do so when the Thousand Sons would once again invade Fenris. And during that fight, he would seemingly slay Maddox once and for all. But he would be confused as to whether or not he actually died because Maddox's illusion would show up again when he fought later on in a different campaign. So that's really cool to me. He has a consistent, defined nemesis. I would love to see more of that. I would love to see more enmity between characters, making motivations personal and stories more tangible and relatable, as opposed to nebulous one side versus the other side. But why is he really on this list, especially right after Grimaldus? Well, it's because he's the one who beheaded Gazgul Maguruk Thraka. The Space Wolves had stepped in to try and curb his growing power, and it was Ragnar Blackmane who felled him, but at great cost to himself as he suffered intense injury, which he only survived after intense surgery that also saw him cross the Rubicon Primaris. So he's now stronger than he's ever been, but so is Gazgul, because Ragnar was horrified to learn that Gazgul had survived and had a new body. So, in desperation, Ragnar would actually slam an orbital station onto the surface of the planet they were fighting on. But it would be to no avail, and Gazgo would escape. And to make matters worse, both of his pet Fenrisian wolves would die in the fighting against Gazgo. He did not just beat him, he humbled his ass. But make no mistake, he is back and stronger than before, so seeing him go after Gazgul to try and settle the score would be awesome in my mind. Now, all that stuff, what with Gazgul getting beheaded, and then the fighting, and then Ragnar becoming Primaris, it all happened in the Saga of the Beast book in the Psychic Awakening campaigns, which was a campaign book and not a novel. But I would love to see some of this stuff put to proper novelization and then expanded upon afterward. Because as we know of so far, there are four characters that Gazgul has given the slip. Grimaldus, Helbrecht, Yerik, and Blackmane. The last we had actually seen of Grimaldus was him off to join Helbrecht and Yerik in their hunt for Gazgul after leaving Armageddon. And when Gazgul slid into the warp and got away from them, Yerik was known to slump down in defeat, knowing that this would bode ill for the galaxy. This would make an amazing storyline, and these four would make one hell of an A-team. Even if Yerik is dead, them going out to avenge him would also be amazing. And if you're gonna kill off Yerik, do it here! Get, send him off like this, it would be perfect. Listen, this whole idea of a Hunt for Gazgul miniseries that I am putting out and pushing so hard really just came to me while I was recording this video, and I've just been babbling about it in real time, but now I'm honestly kind of invested. I really wish GW would do that. Next up on the list, and I'm gonna try and speed things up because I'm starting to run out of time, next up on the list is Artemis, the Mortifactor or Mortificator and Captain of the Death Watch, and you know who this guy is. Now, looking at his lore, it's all very generic. Yeah, he's a mortificator, so he's pretty brutal. He grew up on Postal, which is a world that no longer exists. Blah, blah, blah. Exploits, killing Xenos, this and that. None of it's very special. But the fact that he comes from the mortificators, or mortifactors, is the special thing. Because that is a really interesting and unique chapter that doesn't really get much shine. And I've had a fascination with them ever since I listened to the audio drama called The Taker of Heads by Ian St. Martin, which I highly recommend. Now, they're a very superstitious, 
spiritual, brutal, and barbaric chapter, but they get very little shine. And also, they're connected to another character I would like to see come back named Inquisitor Fidus Crippman, who you've probably also heard of, but he's for another video. But what he's really famous for is his time and work in the Death Watch, and the Death Watch are another group of Space Marines who don't get as much attention, which is a shame because their inclusion makes Loyalist Space Marines a little more interesting. Yes, there have been some Death Watch books, but a lot of them have absolutely sucked. I actually covered one Death Watch book called Warrior Coven in its own video, which unfortunately got age-restricted, and it was one of the worst books I've ever read in my life. So hopefully bringing a named character like Artemis back could help in redeeming the Death Watch narratively. However, I did say you've heard of this character, and the reason for that is because he's the one who may have single-handedly doomed the Eldar race. You see, what happened was Eldrad Ulthran was conducting a ritual that would summon Yenid and banish Slanesh, but Artemis caught wind of this and led the Death Watch in an interception, slaughtering most of the Eldar conducting the ritual and stopping it. And Eldrad himself was literally begging Artemis to not kill them, saying, hey, we will sit back and let you kill every single one of us if you just let us do this one thing. But Artemis said to him, and you've heard of this, I would rather the galaxy and humanity fall to chaos than fall to the influence of Xenos. This might be the single most racist individual in a galaxy that is entirely predicated on racism. So we could hopefully get a recounting of what happened on that fateful day when Artemis interrupted Eldrad's ritual, which could also lead into us getting Eldrad back into the setting because he's been out of it for a long time, as well as once again, contributing to that whole Hunt for Gazgul series that I keep harping on about, which will almost certainly never happen. By dint of the fact that he is of course Death Watch. This guy for his part has yet to ever appear in a proper novel, but I think there's a lot of potential given his various associations. Now, when I mentioned just now that the Death Watch don't get much shine to them these days, that doesn't just apply to them. There's also, of course, the Grey Knights. Now, unfortunately, people actually tend to not like the Grey Knights that much. I've had people say they're lame, they're uninteresting, they're basically Mary Sue's, yada yada yada, and say that the Exorcist Space Marine chapter are much more interesting. However, I like the Grey Knights. I think they're cool and I think they're unique. And they did play a role in Guy Haley's Plague Wars books, which I did enjoy. But the Space Marine I'm talking about was not in those books. His name is Hyperion, and he was the Space Marine who fought Angron to a halt on Armageddon during the Second War for Armageddon, right before the Months of Shame when the Space Wolves would feud with the Grey Knights and Inquisition. And he's known to the Space Wolves as Bladebreaker, because since he is something called a Mirror Psyker, he was able to actually reflect Angron's sword and break it, but very nearly died in the process and he was thereafter sent back to Titan to train the next batch of recruits because of how many had died in the fighting on Armageddon. And furthermore, he is not just any Grey Knight, he's something called a Prognosticar, which are Grey Knights who are particularly effective at sensing fluctuations in the warp and can therefore divine when demonic incursions are going to happen before they happen. Now, Zales is something called a Mirror Psyker, as I said before. What that is, is someone who can sense psychic abilities and sort of like reflect them back at those around him. Like, he'll be able to pick up on psychic conversations that he shouldn't be able to hear and join in on them. Now, that's all very interesting, and as far as I know, he's the only Mirror Psyker we've ever met in the setting. But there's more to him than just being a Grey Knight who could help bring them back into the fold with their own unique stories. You see, we don't meet him as a Grey Knight. We actually meet him as a minor, specifically when he's around like, what, 11 or 12 years old? And at that point, he's not called Hyperion. He's called Zael Affernity, and he shows up in the Gideon Ravener books. You see, the book where he's a Grey Knight is called The Emperor's Gift by Aaron Dembski Bowden, but he shows up in the Ravener series by Dan Abnett. Now, a lot of things happen in that series. It's really good. I highly recommend it. I have a friend who has not read it yet, but has read the Beckwin books, and I know you are watching this video, so I'm once again recommending the Eisenhorn and Ravener books to you. But after that series is concluded, the rest of the Ravener gang show up in the Beckwin books, the following series. However, Zale's Affernity is not. He had joined their retinue early on, and had proved useful because of his abilities, but is now gone. And it's because he was taken to Titan and made into the Grey Knight Hyperion. 
So following up with his story, especially since the Eisenhorn series is going to come to a conclusion with Beckwin Pandemonium, would be really interesting in my mind. Next one is one that I personally want back, and that many viewers of this channel probably want back because of how much I talk about this character. And I mean, Occam the Untrue, leader of the Redacted Warband, and a loyalist member of the Alpha Legion. Now, Occam himself is not actually a born member of the Alpha Legion. He comes from an unspecified gene lineage, but joined the Alpha Legion after the fact, so that he could serve as part of what is known as the Emperor's Test. That being loyalist elements of the Alpha Legion, who we hear about more than see, who believe in the elimination of loyal elements to the Imperium that they deem weak, so that the Imperium will shore up its defenses and that only the strongest will survive and propagate effectively seeing themselves as controlled opposition. Occam and his warband, again despite not being natural Alpha Legionaries, are part of this group, and were part of the larger traitorous warband of the Sons of the Hydras under Quetzal Carthage up until they betrayed and killed him. And they would end up going on a wild goose chase by a Necron Chronomancer, who would send them to retrieve an artifact in exchange for information about the whereabouts of Omegon. However, this would turn out to be a shard of the Deceiver, which they would ultimately imprison and stop. So they still have that shard of the Deceiver, and are now on their own with no Omegon. That's the ending of the one and only book they show up in, but seeing them return would be really interesting. Especially since they were acknowledged in the new Alpha Legion book, Harrowmaster, where a proper traitorous Alpha Legion Lord by the name of Solomon Akura, a reformer and restorer in his mind, would refer to them when they refused his invitation to show up to his gathering as a bunch of pretenders. Another interesting thing about Occam is that not only is he a believer in the cult of the God Emperor, he is a fervent believer, to the point where he would actually kidnap an Imperial Cardinal who would unfortunately unalive himself, to say in YouTube-friendly terms, hours after being captured. So a Calidus assassin who lives on board his ship would disguise herself as the priest so that Occam can effectively go to confession so that he can have his ideas challenged and validated to himself. Now, even though he's from a traitor legion and yes, has killed a lot of loyalist space marines, the reason I put him on this list of loyalist space marines to bring back is because he sees himself as loyalist and him being a loyalist generally makes them more interesting, because it gives them something traitor marines have that loyalists generally don't have. Variety, and different motivations as well as ways to go about them. Traitors, you could get people who believe anything, and are all going about it different ways, so there's so many different story opportunities, but loyalists, as I have said ad nauseum in this video, are pretty one-to-one. -one. They're pretty direct but Occam is not that. And furthermore, given what we now know about the Alpha Legion's motivations come end of heresy, and what we don't know about Omegon, makes him a very interesting player that I would love to see brought back to the galactic stage, especially considering he now has a Catan shard in his possession. Who knows, maybe we can tie him into the hunt for Gazgul by having Gazgul secretly be Omegon this entire time. Next on the list is another heresy era marine. However, this one is for a much more interesting reason than simply being preserved in pickle juice or what have you. And I'm talking about Remus Ventanus, the hero of Kalf. Now, when people talk about ultramarines who did a lot during the Battle of Kalf, their mind generally goes to Aenid Thiel, someone who grew very close to Primarch Rebute Gilliman and who he misses in the current setting. But Remus Ventanus was on the ground at the time, and directing the resistance on the planet's surface and eventually underground during the Underground War, where they fought the word bearers across the entire subterranean arcology of the damaged dying planet. Kalt is now still a planet in Ultramar that does raise regimental troops, so we do know it's populated and still in use. And so great was Ventanus's contributions to the saving of Kalth that he is interred there in the 42nd millennium. However, that was not to last forever, because when Hansu would come to blows with Uriel Ventress, the Ultramarine who is now Primaris and back in the setting, he would eventually end up on Kalth, in the tomb of Remus Ventanus. And when it seemed like all was lost for Ventress and Hansu would get the better of him and kill him, Ventanus would intervene. The 10,000 year old dead space marine would intervene, because he is a canon named member of the Legion of the Damned. He rises from the grave in his Legion of the Damned armor, sends Hansu and his boys packing, and then tells Yuri Ventress the name of a demon lord of the Word Bearers, and gives him an anathame dagger to banish him with and give him true death. Then he just kind of vanishes. He's there for like a second, but still, that's huge. 
We haven't gotten much Legion of the Damned stuff for a while, so seeing a named Loyalist character return as a member of the Legion of the Damned again would be huge in my opinion, especially since Uriel Ventress is back in the setting. Have them meet up again from beyond the grave, I think it would be cool. Now, for these last two, I'm giving fair warning ahead of time, because they're both spoilers for The End and the Death of Volume 3. I know I'm late getting to that video, I know there's gonna be someone in the comments asking where it is, I swear to god I'm getting to it, but with my internship and my university, it's been very difficult. And the last time I took time off to work on a really large video, it facilitated a pretty big hit to my channel analytics and I don't want that to happen, especially since my subscriber count is actually an asset in the field I'm applying to and getting internships in. So I do kind of have to keep grinding the smaller videos. I say right as the audio passes over 30 minutes. Now that everyone who doesn't want to be spoiled has hopefully clicked off, the next on the list are Litu and Barthusa Narek. You see, Litu was the original Space Marine, the one that was used as a template for all others, one of the first originals, or at least the last surviving original. Now, he was actually the guard to Erda, mother of the Primarchs. He went with her and swore loyalty to her, but went with John Grammaticus and his band of idiots when they went to go, hopefully, stop Horus and save the Emperor. Now, a lot of stuff happens over the end of the Death Volume 1, 2, and 3 books, but by the end of it, spoiler, Litu is still alive. Horus is dead, the Emperor is interred on the throne, Terra is in ruins, but Litu was there when Rogel Dorn and the Custodes got to the chamber that the Emperor lay dying in. And he would be the one to tell Rogel Dorn a lot of what happened there. Rogel Dorn would eventually take him and have him sequestered away for questioning. And the last thing Litu would do would be to take some of Horus's own tarot cards that he made, it's a very long story, and add them to his own personal tarot deck. So, he now has this hybridized tarot deck with him, waiting alone in a chamber when last we leave off with him, wondering what his fate will be as Rogel Dorn is the one who's going to decide. And Rogel Dorn is not the most merciful person in the world, but knowing Rogel Dorn after everything that happened, he's almost certainly going to let Lee to live. So what happens there? Does he just get old and die? Does he go into stasis? We need some kind of explanation for as to what happens. And finding out that Lee to just died off screen after all this would be so lame. And speaking of exiting the stage off screen, Barthusa Narek is the loyalist word bearer who broke with Lorgar after coming into contact with a Fulgurite, that being a crystallized shard of the Emperor's power, and resolved to kill Lorgar in order to save his legion from damnation. Now, as we know, this does not happen, and by the time the Siege of Terror rolls around, the Wordbearers are way too far gone. However, Barthusa Narek is briefly mentioned. Specifically, he comes up in The End and the Death Volume 1 in basically one line of text, where he is waiting alone with his sniper rifle with a bullet made of fulgurite in it. We don't know who he's waiting for, we don't know if he thinks Lorgar is going to show up on the planet, we have no idea what happens to him. Because in the other two books, nothing comes up. He just disappears from the narrative after that one line of text in one book. And that's so unsatisfying to me. If you were going to just forget about him like this, why even include him in the End and the Death Volume 1 at all? Just let him fade out of the narrative. Unless they straight up did forget, like they were planning to do something but just forgot to include him in the chaos of everything going on in Volume 2 and 3, which honestly, I could understand. Like, I can genuinely understand that when all that's been done of this character is one line of text so far. And he's not even Dan Abnett's character. He's almost entirely written by Nick Keim. So honestly, odds are we'll never see him again because his storyline just isn't going to go anywhere. What, is he going to kill Lorgar? Is he going to tag team with Corvus Corax to try and hunt Lorgar down after all these years? Okay, actually, that, that, that actually does sound badass. I said that on the spot, but it does sound awesome. However, it would just never happen. But part of me would want that deeply, that he's still out there, that he walks among the stars, wandering, waiting for the day he can finally use that one bullet on Lorgar and take down his father. Maybe he meets up with the Anchorite, that one loyalist word bearer's dreadnought who's interred on a cardinal world and is partly responsible for the way the Imperial cult is now. It's just so interesting to think about. All these characters really are, and I hope we do get to see some of them again at some point or at some form in the future. But what do you guys think? Do you guys want some of these characters back? Do you want all of them back? Or do you think some of these guys would be better left to the annals of 40k history? Are there any characters I didn't mention that you would really love to see return to the setting? 
I'd love to know what you guys have to say in the comments below. Please subscribe if you have not already done so, and until then, I will see you in the next video.